Um, uh, welcome. Just want to welcome our, our guests, specifically uh, Trevor and uh, David, and of course the thesis committee, and the audience that we have globally across different time zones, we hope. Uh, just want to very quickly um, have uh, travel. Be you, you and I have not met, but we have uh, um, exchanged words uh, somehow. Some I remember that. But would you care to introduce yourself other than um, uh, that you are a distinguished guest? And I actually have one of your books that you wrote about uh, Alberta. Well, that's my, I wrote that as an architecture student. So that one's a rare one. It's 400 bucks on eBay if you, <laughs> you sell it. Uh, uh, I'm a, a master's in architecture from Calgary, fellow of the Royal Institute, uh, taught architecture full time for 15 years. Since then, I've been a critic and curator of architecture. I do some consulting for um, developers and architects, largely on housing. Um, I'm a um, multiple visitor to Singapore. I, I live in Singapore for a couple of weeks uh, as an architecture student waiting to get a visa to go to Indonesia. And of course, and then went back as a guest of Moshe Safdi and stayed in Marina Bay Sands a couple of years ago. So I've seen it at uh, two stages of evolution. And Mr. Leong, you don't, that could be a Singaporean name, is it? I'm Malaysian by birth, yeah. Malaysian. Okay. Yeah, my, my wife is Singaporean. Okay. Salaman. Saya uh, berbahasa sedikit bahasa Malaysia. Your bahasa is a bad, much better than my. Than okay, my. that's all right. I won't afflict it on anyone. Okay. That's okay. Uh, neither would I. Uh, right. So David. Oh, uh, uh, and here's a commercial. Here's my uh, book on James <laughs> Chang. Uh, really, the guy who invents Vancouverism or whole typology of tower and podium, etc. So I think Marco's got a copy, and there should be one in your library. Uh, and Marco is coming in. I don't see him yet. Okay. I'm here. I just, oh, you I'm, are okay. I'm, I'm in the background for this. Okay, good. Well, that's um, it. Good. Excellent. David, I know. So I'll just do a bit of pre-introduction and uh, you need to kind of fill me up, uh, fill me in on uh, what uh, you've done since uh, we last lost contact. Uh, David is a U of T graduate, uh, worked for KPMB, did Kitchener City Hall, if I, if I remember correctly and then started uh, Taylor Harari Ponturini, and then eventually uh, the firm evolved to Harari Ponturini, won many, many awards. Uh, we worked together on a couple, yeah, a couple of projects uh, when I was with a different firm. And what have you been doing since? Uh, since we've grown the practice to 150 people, we're continuing to do work across Canada. We're doing work in Vancouver. I just saw Trevor out there a few months ago before all of this broke, unfortunately. And I have the book, Trevor, and it's a great book. Uh, but we've been doing a lot of mixed use master planning, large scale projects, high rise, multi unit projects. We have uh, one young, which is uh, phase one under construction, 65 stories, phase two, the 95 story tower is starting up as well soon. Uh, so we're doing a range of things from residential to uh, commercial retail office, the, the, the whole gamut, and uh, hotels as well. Look forward to participating today. Excellent. Thank you so much. So the rest of the uh, guests are Paolo and Yuri, uh, the, uh, the uh, jury committee members, and Marco, who's our graduate director of the graduate program, and of course, uh, Alex, who is our uh, graduate student, just about to defend his thesis. So you mentioned that you had this pre-recorded. Which is, a, which is a good thing. Uh, so I don't have to cut you off. Uh, you have, I believe, 20 minutes. You're aware of that? Yeah. Okay. So it's yours. Um, and uh, after his presentation, uh, we will have some uh, questions for clarification for Alex. And then we start the formal defense itself uh, through Q&A. And then we wrap up with some last words and then uh, we adjourn. Okay. So Alex, the, the floor is yours. I just have a quick question before we proceed. Um, you know, it's a very lengthy document. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> especially you say your presentation is pre-recorded. Uh, uh, how much of that is devoted to section three? Hmm. Approximately four to five minutes. Okay, because I do think um, that will be the section of most interest as an architectural historian and critic, 
you know, I could do a review of the first two sections. It's a massive document, but uh, really, I think um, uh, David's skills and mine might be best uh, asserted on that last section where you're proposing um, them. So anyway, uh, go ahead if it's pre-recorded. Uh, if you were, it was not pre-recorded, I would ask you to assume that we read all that and jump right into section three. Okay, well, I've, I've kind of prepared it all as, as a as a whole, and it's okay. Sort of all go go ahead. That's fine. I just want we have twenty minutes for this, and then we can. Okay, and then we. There, I I need some clarification on section three things, so we'll do yeah, that. We, we have we have ample time uh, for uh, Q and A, Trevor. So there will okay. be lots of time. To That's do. good to hear. Thanks. All right. Okay. So ahead. I guess we'll get going. Um, I would just like to start by thanking our guests for for joining us and thanking my supervising committee, uh, Yuri and Carlo, for helping me through this process. I'd also like to thank uh, the guys from the shop, my supportive family, my girlfriend, and Dr. Eric Thomas. So I have pre-recorded my presentation because I felt like a video was how I could best take advantage of these rather unique circumstances, but I've prepared just a brief opening and closing statement, which, um, which I'll do live. So to begin with, I'd just like to state that the thinking behind my thesis was rooted in an understanding of isolation as an unfortunate byproduct. Excuse of me, Alex, could you grab the screen? Could you go to main screen? Sorry? Uh, there, I got you. No, never mind. It's OK. It goes with who's talking, I guess. So um, yeah, so to begin, I'd just like to, so sorry. Um, so based, it was rooted in an understanding of isolation as an unfortunate byproduct of certain environments and not a necessary survival, me survival mechanism as it has emerged from our current circumstances. It's uncertain how going forward, our social perception of gathering and social interaction will be altered by all of this. One thing this pandemic, pandemic has illustrated, however, is that the environment has benefited from the absence of having commuters come in and out of cities each day. And I think there might be a lesson in this. So with that, I'll, I'll start my video. Um, just gonna move this over here. All right, everyone can see that? Yeah. Okay, one second. Yep. All right. In today's presentation, I'm going to introduce my thesis, give a summary of my background research, explain the development of my theory through design research, and finish with how these ideas might adapt to a more specific context. Since you might not all be familiar with me, I'll start with a little background story. I grew up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and after high school, I completed a degree in civil engineering. Between my engineering studies and traveling, I developed this fascination for towers. So when I graduated, I showed up at architecture school eager and ready to learn how to design towers. But my architecture undergrad was at Dow, and everything they were asking us to design was of a small scale. So frustrated by this fact, I did what any sane tower enthusiast would do in this situation. I would take the studio project briefings we were given and find a way to make them into a tower. In my final studio course of the program, we were asked to design a public bathhouse for a site on the Halifax waterfront. So of course, it only made sense for me to design two towers for the site and to have the bathhouse bridge the towers at the 17th and 18th story. For weeks, my studio instructor, a very well-respected architect, would tell me he did not approve of this idea. And for weeks, I'd ask why. And eventually, he said this. He said, because towers aren't architecture. I, of course, did not agree. But I get it now. I get what he was trying to say. Because when he thinks of a tower, he thinks of this. He thinks of what I've laid out in my thesis as the common tower. This is a blanket term I gave to towers, residential, commercial, mixed-use towers that were meant to multiply the value of the ground plane, to stack the most profitable units one on top of the other, that were organized vertically in a self-contained volume, and that left the urban realm firmly planted on the ground plane. 
and I've since figured out that it's not the towers themselves that fascinated me in the first place. It was the verticality. It was how they inhabited the airspace above a city. The way I see it, the common tower is simply the default approach to inhabiting the airspace above a city. And there's numerous factors, including building technology, zoning restrictions, land ownership laws, building codes, mobility, financing, that have made this default approach the only practical and permissible way of inhabiting vertical space. But my thesis is this, it's that there is both architectural and urbanistic potential in the settlement of vertical territory that cannot be realized through the default approach of the common tower. My main research question is if a city can be extended vertically in order to inhabit its own vertical real estate. As with any thesis, my research began with a search for precedence. What I focused on and became fascinated with was historic urban scale proposals, designs for how the future city ought to be, or what Alex Krieger refers to as visionary urbanisms. I've broken these into six categories. The first category I entitled Urban Retreat stems from the work of Garnier, Howard, and Soria Mata. As a response to the industrial city, they proposed a retreat into nature, into low density housing spread horizontally where living was separated from other urban activities. Over time, these ideas would evolve into the suburban sprawl we're familiar with today. Then there were those like Gillette and Soleri that argued for mass centralization, centralizing massive populations into single structures or groups of structures in order to free up surrounding land for agriculture and nature reserves. For obvious reasons, these have remained fictional. But the thinking of putting all aspects of a city within a single building is not so far from that behind contemporary mixed-use amenity-filled supertalls like the Burj Khalifa. Multiple ground urbanism included proposals like those by Santelia and Corbett that envisioned networks of public spaces, of pedways, bridges, streets, highways, and trains vertically separated and stacked into the height of a city. In its actual application, this type of thinking produced things like grade-separated pedestrian systems and more recently the interconnected amenity spaces of private developments. Inhabited infrastructure proposals, like those by Hood, Corbusier, and Kenzo Tenge, imagine ways inhabitable real estate could be incorporated into massive highway infrastructure projects like those being built at the time. The concept would even gain some influence but due to opposition, would eventually fail to be implemented on a large scale. The open-ended urban framework proposals by Archigram and the Metabolists opted for a vision of the city as a fluid process. They envisioned large-scale urban frameworks that would enable mobile and permanent spaces to be organized three-dimensionally and to change with shifting societal needs. Some fragments were constructed, but without widespread adoption of an urban framework system, spaces did not achieve the intended mobility. And finally, Towers in the Park was an idea that's most commonly credited to Corbusier, but which was also shared by others like Hood and Ferris. These proposals were reactions to what Coolhouse refers to as the culture of congestion. They proposed the functions of the city needed to be neatly separated and spread far apart with private functions being stacked into towers to save space at the ground for parks, recreation, and most importantly, highways. Considered by Wade Graham to be one of the seven most influential urban ideas, towers in the park thinking helped shape the automobile dependency of the contemporary city and helped cement the common tower as a default approach to verticality. These visionary urbanism proposals represent the foundation of theory from which this thesis emerged and my understanding of them has evolved as I've developed my own position and explored the vertical extension of cities through various mediums of design research. Due to the overwhelming complexity of cities, I found it both useful and necessary to operate within a certain level of abstraction and simplification throughout the process. In order to investigate alternatives to existing urban forms, I needed to develop a three-dimensional understanding of the most basic components of the city. To do this, I combined ideas from Lynch and Rodwin's theory of urban form that reduced all human inhabitation to two components, the flow system and adapted spaces, which is similar to a second reduction we're more familiar with, which is figure ground mapping that reduces cities to public, private, solid, void, figure ground. 
Originally, I thought I could just bend this thinking vertically. But what I found was that these binary reductions of urban forms are incapable of properly representing the city in three dimensions. Unlike on the ground plane, in three-dimensional space, public spaces or the flow system and voids are no longer the same thing. The flow system is the surface, while the void becomes the unbuilt airspace above. Therefore, to reduce the city to its most basic components in three dimensions, a three-part system is required. The public flow system is the parts of the city concerned with the circulation and flow of people and goods. This can be further classified into the surface elements, the streets, paths, bridges, plazas that make up the public realm, the utility elements, things like pipe networks, and the dynamic elements, the vehicles and systems that mechanically move people and things around the city. Voids are the unbuilt volume of the city. And adapted spaces are everything else, all indoor and outdoor spaces and surfaces meant for localized activity. I've further broken down adapted spaces by uses and functionality for reasons which I'll explain in a moment. The first is urbanistically dependent spaces. These are shops, parks, and civic spaces like libraries, things that depend on the direct adjacency to the public realm, the surface elements of the public flow system. And then there's urbanistically independent spaces. Things like offices, condos, storage facilities that may benefit from but do not directly rely on direct adjacency to the public realm for their success. To explain all of this, let's take a look at the default approach of organizing a city with common towers. In the default approach, the public flow system exists only at the ground plane where it supports urbanistically dependent spaces. The extension into the vertical dimension of the city occurs only in the form of urbanistically independent spaces, with all vertical flow of people and things occurring within the boundary of these spaces. Based on this established abstraction of the city, my main research question of extending the city vertically then becomes an investigation of how to extend the public flow system and the urbanistically dependent spaces above the ground plane into the height of the city. Early on, I explored this extension through a multiple ground urbanism type of thinking. The same thinking that produced both the Calgary plus 15 system and Ken King's proposal for a vertical city. Basically, multiple ground planes that would link private towers at regular intervals throughout the height of a city. But from studying landscape urbanism, I discovered there was a flaw in this logic because it assumes the ground plane or the public flow system was something that could just be multiplied and fragmented. In reality, if these secondary ground planes were dependent on private towers for access, then they wouldn't really be extensions of the public flow system, but rather just semi-public spaces. For the public flow system to be extended vertically in a way that's actually public, this needs to occur in a way that's unconditional, continuous, and external from private real estate. In the winter studio, I explored this as a continuous landscape, a shared infrastructure that would wrap through and bridge between towers throughout the height of a city. But my understanding evolved. I realized I was defaulting to towers, to an understanding of the city as a series of objects in space that I was trying to link together. And so I thought, how about if instead of organizing objects in space, I subtracted from the space itself? First the public flow system, then the voids, then what was left over would be the adapted spaces of the city. But the volumes of a city aren't solids, so I began to add pieces together to simultaneously organize the public flow system, the voids, the urbanistically dependent and independent spaces of the city, all within an abstracted volume. What emerged from this was a volumetric approach to planning and organizing a city where provisions for the extension of the public flow system could be mapped three-dimensionally through a city as a sort of public right away, and then where adapted spaces would be designed in a way that would accommodate and support this. My next step was to figure out what kind of city I was trying to organize. Walkability and the principles behind walkable cities became a primary driver for my research. Urban design that fosters urbanity, street life, community, the overlap of a city's functions and activities, all without the need for automobile dependency, is very compatible with a dense vertical context. 
Walkable city blocks with firm, interesting street edges could be reconfigured to introduce vertical work through sloped planes. The urbanistically dependent and independent spaces of neighborhoods with sufficient localized densities to support local schools, parks, civic buildings, and small businesses could be layered into the height of a city connected through walkable city blocks. The utility and dynamic elements of the public flow system could also be adapted to move people and things vertically, horizontally, and diagonally through the volume of the city. And finally, through a volumetric approach to planning, the city could be stitched seamlessly together into a three-dimensional network of walkability, where walkable blocks and walkable neighborhoods are physically connected by main streets and public transit infrastructure, but bound together by strategic placement of anchors like parks, cultural centers, and attractions. Now, planning the volume of a city may seem pretty extreme if we think of most North American cities. But in the fall, thanks to the OGS scholarship, I embarked on a research trip to a city where the climate, land ownership practices, governmental structure, and existing built environment made these ideas seem just a little bit less extreme. In Singapore, I found a unique brand of vertical architecture with features like external circulation, climbing public spaces, sky gardens, sky bridges, sky streets, and even sky transit. These are what I call uncommon towers because they're innovative architectural responses to the imposed limitations of the default approach to verticality. You see, Singapore had no choice but to grow vertically. It's a small city state with no hinterland and a booming population, but it wasn't always this way. Prior to self-governance in 1959, the architecture of the city was different Yes, it was less vertical, but it was also a highly sociable environment where the functions of the city overlapped. The city streets were lined with live-work shop houses that fostered a rich, urban environment. Numerous shop house districts still exist and thrive today, but many were destroyed in the name of urban renewal. When population density forced Singapore to grow vertically, Singapore defaulted to the only proven way of doing so, through common towers. And just like in many other cities, growing vertically meant abandoning the existing architectural forms of urban life. It meant neatly separating and organizing the functions of the city into separate silos. But now, with the population packed away into the height of the city, there's a yearning for the community and urbanity that was left on the ground. This is what has fostered the uncommon towers, and why the pursuit of decent density is one of the city's main objectives. But uncommon towers are a solution to a self-imposed problem. Even now, new development regions like Marina South are defaulted to common towers before any designers are ever involved. It's from this point that they request dynamic urban neighborhoods with a wide variety of integrated land uses, active streets, and engaging public spaces. Requests that force designers to innovate their way out of the common tower straitjacket. But what if instead they took a step back and looked at new development not as towers but as a volume that could truly foster the type of decent density the city is seeking? Or rather a series of volumes that continue to allow ocean breezes to cool down the city. Within these volumes, the components of the city could be planned three-dimensionally with provisions for main streets, with surface transit systems along major axes through the site, and a vertical transit system linked into existing transit hubs that together would support a three-dimensional network of vertically walkable neighborhoods, and which would all be bound together by plans for strategically placed and activated anchors. These plans for accommodating a walkable network of neighborhoods into the height of the city could then be what would inform future development, and it's then likely that the design of this future development may in turn serve to enrich the network itself. You see, if this extension of Singapore was planned volumetrically, then well-established regional precedents like shop houses that foster a rich urbanity could be adapted and reinterpreted as part of the vertical architecture of the city. They could continue to serve as a continuous engaging street edging as they're layered vertically into neighborhoods, above and below spaces for living, working, learning, etc. They could be a pivotal part of dynamic urban neighborhoods where street life, opportunities, resources, culture, entertainment, and a sense of community are not diminished by how far the city grows vertically from the ground plane. So to conclude, of course towers are architecture, but the common towers we're familiar with are essentially a single architectural solution to inhabiting the vertical territory of a city. 
And while efficient, this default approach imposes design constraints which are not conducive to the rich urbanity that stems from embracing intensity and enabling the overlap of the many activities of a city. And my theory is that it's necessary to imagine the city beyond this default approach to truly capture the full architectural and urbanistic potential of verticality. All right, um, just a quick closing statement. Um, so studying architecture has brought in my perspective. I showed up at architecture school with ambitions to understand and participate in making great towers. And while I remain a tower enthusiast, I'm leaving architecture school four years later with ambitions to understand and participate in making great cities. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, so that is his presentation. I would uh, open up the floor uh, just for clarifications for now. If uh, if his twenty minutes was one clear enough, uh, if you if you have any questions for Alex, uh, we this is the time uh, for that. And then after that, we'll go into the defense itself. So if I can maybe just open up the floor to whomever wanted uh, some clarification points from Alex. Um, Alex, your phrase uncommon tower is itself an uncommon phrase. It's, it's not in the literature very much. You also pointedly avoid the more common uh, phrases like point tower, slab tower. Could you define uncommon tower to us? Um, so I, I guess the uncommon tower, the way I saw it, was a, a tower that is attempting to create sort of public spaces within its height um, is the sort of the main the main dif differentiation between a, a common tower and the uncommon tower. And then my, my critique of those sort of public spaces is they're they're limited in their ability to actually function as proper public spaces. Uh, just to clarify, would uh, Unité Habitation by Corbusier be an uncommon tower? Um, I don't know. I don't think it's a, a black and white uh, differentiation, but I think that would be, uh, yeah, it, it would certainly be a, an uncommon tower um, as to it's how I kind speed, of define the common tower. Here. It's got a roof garden, you know, it's got a number of, uh, I, I thought it was kind of conspicuously missing from your, your, uh, your history. Um, David, ask a question. I'm going to sort my stuff out here. Uh, David, you need your mic on. Yes, yeah. No, I just noticed I'm, I'm muted. Um, the other thing I was interested in was a lot of this is focused on the idea of walkability, which makes a lot of sense. Did you look at other uh, modes of transportation or circulation up in the buildings? I mean, the image on the right looks like it has is that a streetcar or something that's moving through the building or um, buses or is it all about walkability? Does it have to do with also looking at, you know, what do you do in terms of bikes, in terms of vehicles, in terms of alternative modes of, uh, you know, instead of just vertical transportation, some of the new elevating devices that look at moving horizontally or was it just focused on walkability? Uh, so one of my chapters was actually focused on just sort of the various technologies like like you said, the, the horizontal and vertical uh, elevator or the elevators, the maglev elevators yeah. um, that could function as different forms of transportation within the height, within a three dimensional city. Um, so I, I, so basically the ones that I sort of worked with were um, a vertical transit system was the one I sort of more explored in, in this part of the project was a vertical transportation, uh, public transit, and then a surface level that went along what I defined as the public flow system or public flows, the surface of the public flow system. But I left it open to to basically state that there's many forms that could be included in this. And what, was there an analysis of light view and privacy issues on all of this? Or is that something that you kind of said is secondary to the overall thesis or to the overall idea? 
I, I think that's a, a, an entire kind of thesis in itself. Yeah. Um, the, the light view in privacy is definitely something, but something about sort of the climate of Singapore is the, the sort of the daylighting, the, the emphasis on, uh, of gathering spaces and stuff like that being, you know, completely out in the open is different than we would perceive of them here because the amount of their, their sunshine, their climate is consistent throughout the year. So it's not, they're not taking advantage of the, the few sunny days they get like we do in here in Canada. Okay, um, Yuri and Carlo, would you have any questions for clarification? Um, I don't have any questions for clarification. I mean, as, as Alex's supervisor, I think I'm fairly familiar with the, with the project, um, but even still, um, I found this to be a very um, comprehensive uh, presentation that touched upon the various threads that have been moving through this thing for the last year. Um, I didn't know about your your two bookends, you know, about towers not being architecture. I thought you loved them at the beginning, and you know, slowly but surely, uh, that that seems to change. But no, this. Um, maybe this is a, a closing comment, but I'll leave it for now. I, I think that you've covered in your presentation um, the various strands that you've been looking at and evolving, quite frankly. Um, this has certainly been very much an evolutionary uh, process. When I think about um, the very first sketches that you had produced when we were sitting in a cafe here somewhere uh, to, to what's evolved from that, um, but the what shall we call it, the sort of genealogy of the whole thing is, is traceable, where, you know, this begat that and this kind of thinking begat that. And you certainly did expand your, uh, uh, you know, despite not, not having Corbusier's project in the thing, your, um, your perspective on what you were looking at and the issues that needed to be addressed evolved as the project evolved. So um, I have no questions for, for clarification. Um, and, and the kind of questions about, you know, how do you move around, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think you took this to, to a certain level of resolution. And then as you say, now to get into some higher level of resolution of take your pick, privacy, transportation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's another thesis in, in and of itself. Um, but the climactic, the climatic um, context the political context, the government context, the financial context, the social context is something that I think, um, Trevor, going back to your point, is, is foundational to the part three um, portion. And it really does inform what, uh, what Alex has uh, come up with in the end. Yeah, no, I, I, would, I would agree with Yuri. Um, and I, I too don't need any clarifications. Um, I would, I guess, just to add to what Yuri said, um, it, it, it is a comprehensive project and I, I commend you on kind of an operational modeling approach that you took. Um, and then in the, the portion of the book that you um, refined the visionary urbanism, um, you pointed to um, the futurists and um, people that developed a drawing language or an operational drawing language for a way of representing their work. And um, you mentioned um, how they would focus in on fragments um, of the project and not try to explain the whole project. And um, I, I know that your mode of presentation was always um, through models. Uh, your representational technique and your operational design technique was through models. And you transitioned to, to drawing in a nice way. And I, I'd say that the, the fragments that you show in the drawing language that you're developing starts to get at some of the the comprehensive nature of um, your thought process. Even though you, you may not look at solving everything, you can tell through the way that you're drawing that you're thinking about these things. So um, I think that was really well done. Dear Alex, a lot of your thesis turns on the concept of streets in the air. Now, streets in the air has not had a particularly happy history in the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, the Smithsons' famous Robin Hill Gardens has been demolished. 
uh, Le Corbusier Street, Retail Street, Unité was never a success. Uh, every generation you have towers uh, building air bridges, et cetera, between them as a kind of cliche that comes and goes. Vancouver has 10 towers now that link to their neighbors, sometimes in a banal way with a swimming pool shared by each, et cetera. But your whole thesis seems to turn on the notion of taking the qualities of streets and even indeed the architectural typology of the shop house and, and stacking it up. In other words, you're informing the tower with the street and indeed a vernacular typology. Your thesis says very nothing really about the ground plane around these. So there's been a complete uh, focus up there. Maybe you had to. Um, if, if you were go going to, if you have those empty pages that enter your thesis to represent the ground plane, what would you show? What, how do these creatures meet the ground? Um, so so Alex, was... Alex, before you answer that, uh, I just, I'm sorry, Trevor, I'd just like to uh, have one of our known guests, um, Marco, if there's any uh, clarification points, if you do not mind parking uh, your response, uh, Alex. I uh, just, I do not want to ignore Marco. No, no worries. Um, no, no questions for clarification. I found the presentation to be quite complete and um, consistent with what we've been seeing in the various milestones up until here. I think the questions that Trevor is now raising, I think are really important and interesting, uh, but no questions for clarification. Okay, thank Thanks. you. I, I do have one question um, and um, again, uh, the same accolades from everybody else, but my question, and this is not a critique, uh, my question is very simply, did you manage to study uh, in your investigation if there are any natural limits to this model that you're using in terms of a minimum or maximum? In other words, how scalable is this up and down? Did you manage to study that? If the answer is no, that's fine. I just, I just need to know that in my head. Uh, is your is your kind of concern? I'll I'll come back to Trevor's point in just a second. Um, okay. YT, so is your concern that, or not your concern, but your your question that like, could it be you know just a partial fragment, or could it, or like how big would it have to be? Exactly. Is yeah. That, did you study uh, that? My question is, did you study that? I I didn't study it in depth. My my thinking would be that it would need to start with some sort of large scale development as a catalyst. Okay. And then from there, it could be added on in a piecemeal kind of manner, but that it, would, it couldn't be initiated without a large intervention into a, into a city. Okay. Um, so that, can... that was about as far as I got in terms of as really wrapping my head in and articulating that. Um, yeah. As far as, you know, how small could it really, could each little piece get? before it, the whole system breaks down is, I think, uh, again, a whole uh, another level of resolution, which we need to get to. Okay, I wasn't looking for an answer. Maybe in the natural defense of your thesis, it might reemerge uh, because that's a curious point for me. Uh, so sorry, uh, Trevor. So we're gonna go back to Trevor's uh, question and Alex, your, your answers to that. And this is the beginning of the defense, uh, okay. starting at Trevor. So so Trevor, just to, to your point, it, the, the, how the, this idea connects to the ground plane um, is something that we've, we've discussed numerous times throughout this, this process, Yuri and Carlo and Marco and at my other milestone presentations. And basically the, the thing about it is I laid out three criteria for how what I defined as the public flow system would need to climb into the city. And how that differentiates from streets in the sky, which is what I sort of labeled as the sort of multiple ground urbanism, is the streets in the sky are a plane above, um, like a plane above a secondary ground plane, right? As a sec sort of second second ground or multiple grounds. But my what I argued is the the main requirement for this type of system is that it's not a series of planes but something that's continuous unconditional and external so that meant that it couldn't be an amenity space bridging between towers because that wouldn't serve this function 
as a as a sort of extension of of the city. It couldn't it it couldn't be uh, it couldn't be a public space in the sky that had to be accessed through private real estate. And in the same way, it couldn't be if we think of you know the the great separated pedestrian networks like Calgary Plus Fifteen or the Toronto Path Network. These are, are are places that close. They have a closing hour. They have you know their shops. They're they're a, they're basically a mall, right? So it needed to be external from from private real estate because streets to be public our streets and our sidewalks. They don't have a closing hour. They're not conditional on whether you're a shopper or not a shopper. So those were the kind of the three criteria and how it met the ground plane, I think could be interpreted in many ways, but how I viewed it as something that occurred in those three, based on those three criteria. I think one of the most problematic uh, aspects of your thesis is your over huge reliance on ramps. You've imputed, they are the device of ensuring flow. Now, if you look carefully at your ramps, even the little wooden model in the uh, portion of the model in this image here, those ramps are so steep that they would defy most forms of urban occupation. Yes, they could be walked upon, but they would not serve as amenable uh, spaces, uh, exposed to the elements, raised up in the air, uh, steep. And as far as I can see, could we go to the ele drawn elevation of your tower? Could you go to that drawing? Is it this section here? No, the tall, the complete building elevation. Uh, this full version of that, not section. I, I, I didn't have a an, an elevation that that I produced from from this. You mean like maybe the it is the cross section because there is no elevation that I recall. There was one, maybe a model. That showed, Can you see that? It could be a model that showed the uh, the staggered storefronts and a very steep. Uh, um, uh, that'll do for now. Uh, okay. That model shot. So. Uh, it's not clear if that ramp we see there is continuous in ramp spiral fashion around the tower. They seem to start and stop randomly. In other words, they're not a continuous flow device. You're not circulating um, through large parts of the building. You have multiple movement systems, including ramps, stairs, elevators, et cetera, but virtually no attention to how they meet the ground. They're not treated any differently when they reach the ground uh, than they are above. And I think there's a difficult politics in this project is that I don't think those streets are public and it's, it's a fantasy to pretend they are. They're like streets within a golf resort. They are internal to the activities and residences, whatever within them. So in other words, a truly public domain, public streets on the ground plane, these are called streets, but I'd have a hard time doing that. I don't think they are streets. They are flowways, passageways, corridors, other things. But I think you failed at the ambition of creating streets in the air. So just to that point about this model. So while this model reads as a tower, what it actually is, is a volume that would a volume of something larger. So within the, the point of that model was to actually to explore what I defined as walkable blocks. So I'll open this photo here. So this was what basically how it um, extended. So basically it's one of those units of a block that wraps continuously within the, the height of the building, extends maybe beyond that volume for a certain portion, and then is would reemerge into that same volume uh, higher up in the building, but that would occur in a continuous manner. Um, does that so? If, you're, I you're, just, if I may just add in, this okay. is but a portion, Trevor, of of a scheme. This is not 
this is not a self-defined entity in and of itself. He's proposing it as a template for city building, so it has to be treated as such. Um, you know, if these are usable ideas. It's very strange, you've taken some almost new urbanist notions, walkability, re reviving the sh shop front, uh, shop house, et cetera, and then stacked them up, uh, and, and then made bridges to the neighbors. But you haven't made an argument visually even in text for, for the actual livability and habitability of them. You call them walkable. Yes, and you can walk up a big ramp, I guess, and go by shop fronts that would be, be denied random access because you have to find a tor tortuous way up through in section elevator walkway to get there. So, I mean, it, it's a, there's a lot of tautologies in your thesis. You take assumptions and you prove your own assumptions. There's logical loops. And the physical manifestation of these tautologies is a lot of self-referential self-quotation stacked and collaged together. But when you pull it apart, you have to get very, very tough about what is a street, what is public, uh, and so on. And I think those, are, despite your amazing energy, some of the fundamental issues are are, are bothersome here. And I understand, I, I take uh, your, your tutor's uh, caution that this is a kind of probe into city building, uh, but it's, it's um, you know, it's got some holes. The other strange thing is, other than a well, single reference to um, TD Square, there's virtually no reference to Toronto or indeed anything Canadian in this thesis. Your city, has got 1,500 high-rises, more than any other high-rises. Uh, uh, it's the most committed to high-rise living of any city in North America, yet it doesn't pick up. So you, you spent these months in the library, and good on you. It's, it's a fabulous piece of scholarship in a way. It needs a good edit. You know, you've, you've, you've looked at a lot of stuff, but you, it seems like you didn't look out the window. Why, why does Toronto not pop up as an example, a counterindication, a possibility? And as far as I can see, there's not a photo of your own in there. You've gone to other sources when you have your own eyes and your own abilities. So uh, let's start with that. What, why is Toronto missing? Okay, um, two points. All the photos in there of Singapore, all the buildings of Singapore, they're actually from, they're my own photos from my research trip. I spent the, my time there trying to get up into all these sky gardens and trying to find what was actually public or what was you know what you had to sit in the elevator and pretend you you went you were part of that hotel to get to um and so those photos were mine why i didn't focus on toronto i did investigate toronto in studio um last winter so i, I had this same kind of idea and i explored it in toronto um during that studio but what how Singapore emerged was because of the criteria that I said have led to the sort of common tower, which included our, the understanding of land ownership, um, building codes, building codes is not, is not a big one, but land ownership, governmental structure, th these kinds of things that have actually led to the common tower being the, the default approach. What I saw in Singapore was a bit of a, a change, right? You have a public or a, you have a, a population that 80% of them are housed by the government, right? Within that, you have people that own little pockets of air throughout the entire city. And then, but it's it's not like a condo here where they own a pocket and then collectively they own the building or, you know, somebody owns the building. It's in Singapore, they own the pocket and the government owns the the hallways and the elevators. So that, you know, that simple, understanding of, of land ownership. Land ownership is also not dealt out as a, you know, you own it forever. Much of the land and, and, and that stuff is dealt out on leaseholds. So a more of a temporary understanding or a dynamic understanding of the city. So that's why Singapore became the, the that and, and other reasons became why Singapore uh, was a sort of focus of the application of this and where those conditions aren't present in, in Toronto or other North American cities. 
Well, I'll pass to David in a second, but your thesis is amazingly non-programmatic. You're form making, you're making spaces, but you spend very little time proposing what uh, activities uh, occur there. If you really grill the idea of shop house, yes, it is a shop. Yes, it is a residence. And it also is a factory. It's a place of production. Uh, things are made, finished, cooked, whatever. So residential um, uh, retail, and, and if you want factory production. Now it strikes me your thesis would be more interesting and more uh, engaging if you've gone past the purely vol volumetric and tectonic explorations you've done to get a little more serious about that stuff. Uh, I, I would love to have found out that some of those blocks or boxes are, um, you know, server farms, are, uh, you know, medical testing labs, whatever, you know what I mean? That you've taken that aspect seriously because you think broadly and, and inclusively. But that is a the programmatic element in the thesis is, is a kind of bubble. And it's too bad because I think that's where you can bring livability and you won't be just make form making for form sense. Those programmatic uses of industrial production, retail and living brought in into sectional congruence would make it actually a much more interesting project. Otherwise you, you do an awful lot of collaging and, and replicating, flitting, flipping and inverting. You're doing a lot of transformations a uh, 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 volume, but not informed by the discipline of program. Yeah, I I found the the scope of what I was trying to look at was was so large that in order to grasp it within the the reasonable amount of time of the of the thesis, I had to operate within that sort of abstracted level of understanding, which I I've explained the sort of my abstraction of it. I found it necessary to operate within that that abstracted level for most of most of my time because just because of this the scope of the project and um, I did you know like this section I'm showing here were some explorations into the sort of programming of that but again um, that that wasn't the main the main focus I I explored it to kind of you know show some possibilities. But I, I wasn't interested. One of the sort of lessons I, 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 you know, developed from studying all the visionary urbanism proposals was that some of the actual presentation of the final, you know, the, this is my future city designed, that actually undermined the strength of a, some a lot of the embedded ideas in those arguments, and it was the actual um, realization of of that by a single, you know, a single mind or, you know, a few minds, it that actually undermined and, and weakened the, the sort of under the ideas of some of those proposals. It was, well, was maybe, I have to say the question, let's pass to David now and I'll come back to a couple of things. Yeah, I think, I mean, as a start, I was quite impressed by the document. I was impressed by the amount of research that's gone into it. I really like the models. Uh, the sketches that uh, that were part of the package as well. I get I get the idea that it, uh, working at this scale, it's very hard to get into the detailed design of of some of these elements and to get into the program and kind of kind of understand that. One of the things I'm really curious about, though, is um, this idea of uh, editing or you know how scalable is this? And when you see this multiplied out the way. If you go back to that image that you had beside the Marina Bay Sands Hotel, where you've got the the the, the whole kind of four or five block, yeah, this image. Like what I'm what I'm really curious about is after having gone through the whole exercise, when you kind of step back and look at the thesis, and you look at the ideas, and you look at this drawing, and you look at the kind of complexity of all this, is there a point where you kind of say to yourself, well, I think I need some design guidelines to kind of say that this this works to a certain scale, it works to a certain density. I don't know if you ever calculated densities. It works It works to a, a, a kind of a, it has its own limitations. And I'm wondering if there are any limitations or if you were to, 
if you were asked to, after this thesis, write a set of design guidelines for something like this, what would come out of that exercise? Would, would you, would the next iteration of this be at this scale? Would it be at this kind of density? Would it be at this kind of, um, you know, sense of, uh, I mean, this is a sense of urbanism where you take some of the buildings that we all can relate to in, uh, in, in Singapore, I haven't been there yet, but seen a lot of images where you see these buildings that are these kind of standalone buildings or a group of three or four towers. If you have 50 of these towers side by side, creating a whole block in a whole district like this, would you consider that to be a good thing? Or is that uh, coming out of your thesis, what would, what would you say would be a good kind of limitation or, or how would you scale this? Or is it something that is scalable the way you've drawn it here and that you feel confident that it would work. Um, okay. So in terms of a set of sort of design guidelines, I think what you said, the, the density, like a sufficient density to sustain these other parts of, of the city is definitely, you know, I did do some research into it, but I couldn't find, you know, the magic the magic number. I did, you know, read a, a series of things, but I didn't really find that there was this sort of magic density number. So um, I think the, but the density becomes a, a big part of it. Um, but why I got talking into in neighborhoods and um, right. So you talked about the, the, so I guess neighborhoods, they operate, you know, as a self-sufficient sort of density, but they also are connected to the neighborhood beside them and the neighborhood beside them and the neighborhood beside them and the neighborhood, beside them and the neighborhood be hood beside them. So one of the precedents that I studied that I studied when I was there, I went to, I visited, was uh, Skyville at Dawson by uh, Woha, mm -hmm. which was, you know, it, uh, periodically every kind of 12 stories, they have these, uh, let me see if I have another picture. They have these, these sky streets, right? So these are these communal spaces that serve as this gathering place. And they're linking, what, 10 towers together, eight, eight towers. Um, so they support a certain level of community. I was there, I, I witnessed, you know, small children riding their scooters around them, you know, 30 feet or 30 floors in the air. So they, they, they sustain a certain amount of neighborhood. They, they describe them as sky villages. But I would, my argument is that a sky like a village or a neighborhood has more than just communal gathering spaces and housing it has the other parts of the city and it also is connected to a larger whole so why so the fact that these are sort of isolated up in the air limits their ability to sustain other forms other urban forms and other forms of architecture within their height so they're limited to you know certain uses Mm -hmm. um, I guess that back could back to the guidelines. Um, yeah, could you just maybe well, expand I guess, on that a little? I, I guess. I guess the the question of the guidelines comes from the fact that you know all of the material that you're showing, you're kind of showing this interesting continuous loop you've got retail or different shop uses that line these things but is there a kind of hierarchy in all of this and uh if there is uh what is it for you that kind of establishes that hierarchy or how do you set that up or is are all all these pathways the same is there a hierarchy of routes um you know what are what are what are the different characters of these uh these, these pathways and these routes. And, and you know, I, I, I tend to agree with Trevor about the ground plane, but I understand the, the exercise here was to really look at how do you extend that ground plane vertically. Um, and and it's, it, it's a, to me, it's a, it's a very interesting conversation. It's a very interesting problem to try to tackle. I mean, we have a struggle in the city of Toronto to kind of go back to Toronto to get the city to even think about a second floor second level path uh, connection these days bridges that go across the streets they're horrified whenever we, we kind of propose something like that but certainly in, in in higher density cities and in cities like singapore and cities other asian cities 
you start to recognize that uh, the, the higher density necessitates having to live on multiple levels. And it's not just about a ground plane, it's about a, you know, it's about an elevated pathway and, and how those things all work. So it's, it's, it's kind of, it, it's interesting to see this notion of public realm or public streets taken from the ground floor, taken up to a second level, and then to go to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 levels up. And I'm just wondering if there are like, what are your insights in terms of uh, guidelines that you provide for coming out of this exercise? Or are, are you're okay with this, you know, extending these all the way up? Th there is no, there is no height at which um, these things don't work anymore or couldn't work or you think are too far up or too far out. Yeah. So I think that that was part of my exploration was, you know, we have the cities like Hong Kong where stuff, um, you know, it, it it's multiplied and extended vertically to an extent, right? Four stories, six stories, however many stories above the ground plane mm -hmm. is how, how far those sort of secondary networks are, are sustained. Mm -hmm. um, but what I was interested in exploring was why that can't be uh, extended even further. Mm -hmm. Now, to your guidelines in terms of the sort of hierarchy, what I thought in terms of how I was thinking about hierarchy was that through sort of a volumetric thinking of, of the city, you would have certain main streets, main streets kind of, or main sort of corridors secured in, within the volume of a city as a sort of as of right. So as development expands to that point, um, that it would necessitate that that is, is, is supported. And then within that, the sort of more fine grained things could be something that would be uh, added to and figured out in a sort of secondary uh, level of hierarchy. Right. And that, so basically that you would, that the planning of the sort of volume would have the, the things that put the public interests first, the, the main streets, the transit, the, those kinds of things and that the neighborhoods, those things would sort of be added sec in, in a secondary fashion. Right, so um, in this image that you've got up right now, is there, a, is, there a, like a, is there a hierarchy between some of these pathways? It looks like some of them have, some of them have vehicles or something traveling along them and then they're a little wider and then some of them are narrower. Is, is that, does that exist here? Is that what you've kind of rendered yeah, here? Yeah, so, in my, if I can just pull up my video again, I will mute it. But as I sort of, went through it, basically yeah. I thought that, you know, like these would be the main accesses through the site. Right. And that from that, transit and then the sort of secondary so they're like some sort of hierarchy of um of spaces and that the the, the position of anchors played it played a key role kind of the study of anchors the things that um that make a city walkable isn't just that you know you have these sort of paths oops i forgot this was a video but it was that you have destinations that that link things together and that anchors, which I represented here in blue, um, that positioning th these type of things, a library, a restaurant, a, you know, a certain street that has bars on it or something like that, positioning these things within the volume of the city could be what would actually make it a sort of three-dimensional network. And the positioning of these sort of attractions and civic buildings and stuff like that not just on the ground plane, but above would be what actually serves to sort of tie all these paths together. So they're not just paths, but that it would actually be part of the city. And that these would be, you know, sort of planned ahead of time to some extent. Right. Okay. Um, uh, I'm just going to ask either Yuri or maybe uh, Carlo to uh, offer their comments. Uh, well, maybe just uh, I'll, I'll jump in just to build on 
um, some of the last comments about hierarchy. Um, like, like I do agree um, that th this this you've you've created a flow, um, a continuous flow, and I think that flow is actually um, for me made up of strands. Um, so, in terms of being able to address the hierarchy, um, starting from the ground level, you can start to look at uh, and establish the various flows that make up the existing ground level. Um, you know, just to be really simple about it, you've got streets, you have sidewalks, you have walking surface, driving surfaces. And I'm curious about um, how the, the, the division of these strands as they, they go up can thicken, thin, bifurcate and separate. And I think that would be an interesting layer to actually add to um, the framework that you've created. Um, and I, I think that would start to address um, how the architecture can kind of start to combine with um, the this kind of exospatial condition that you're creating. So it's an external flow, but there are internal flows that are important to um, um, even this redefinition of tower. Um, so I, I, I think adding those layers will will bring you bring this project to that next level. Okay. I think it's it's difficult. Um, to get away from thinking in terms of quote unquote common towers and the ground plane. And whatever is being proposed is always, at least initially, looked upon in reference to, oh, this is really, a, you know, a series of towers and they're connected in some novel way, for example. Um, the, the idea of extending a public realm vertically is an interesting one. And I take um, Alex's point that, you know, Toronto wouldn't be the place to do that. In Singapore, given its land ownership and governance structure, et cetera, is potentially providing that opportunity to even conceive of this kind of a thing, which brings up another interesting um, sort of issue. And that is that not all of these, let's, let's take it, um, you know, residential and urban um, issues um, will be solved through architecture, okay? And recognizing that um, legal and political and economic, but certainly legal and political aspects really do frame what can be conceived of architecturally is, um, is to my mind, a, a pretty fundamental um, aspect of, uh, of what Alex has discovered here, okay? Um, but apart from that, you know, interesting stuff. You got people riled up, Alex. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> well done, you know. So so that's good. I mean, without that, obviously, there, there's, you know, there's, there's some issues here. There's some concerns here. Um, but I think that, you know, they wouldn't have been raised had you not done this work and presented it to us. So, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, I think the, the other thing that I just wanted to mention is the uh, not only is the book theoretical and the research theoretical, but the empirical research that you put into it is very mature, the way that you've gone about um, analyzing Singapore and the, um, the kind of summary of that. I, I congratulate you on that as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I, I think uh, Dave, uh, David's point about hierarchy is uh, pretty essential uh, because in the end, your system proposes that all of all of them are the same or equally important, both as they extend over blocks and as they go up. And I think inevitably in architecture and city building, there has to be hierarchies of, of use and importance. And often those are driven by things like transit, where the transit stations are. And that's a, a missing piece here, because that gives you the pulse of people, activity, et cetera, locating those carefully and strategically in a few places could make your system so much more believable rather than just as a, a three-dimensional diagram. I have to admit, I was skeptical about Marina Bay Sands generally until I, uh, I stayed there for a couple of days, courtesy of Moshe. And what's, it was the urban design of it that impressed me. I mean, the going from the rail level below the casino, the big spaces, et cetera, truly a public, indoor public street, one of the few in the tropics that really works. And then up through the building to the, to the park at top, 
that is a park, even though not everyone can go there. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, but integration with transit, multiple functions, all the way up, uh, uh, an inhabitable public space, and a place you want to be. Uh, to me, it's a pretty good paradigm of a lot of things you wanted to do here. But there is a hierarchy. There's not, you know, not everything everywhere. Things happen in certain places for, for reasons. So I guess there's a lack of discipline um, that in, in the thesis. And by the way, your historical research has got the same problem. You pass over example after example after example, you empty up the library, you look at everything. But synthetic, pulling together an understanding is kind of missing. You know what I mean? So good on you. You've got the more footnotes than I've ever seen in any thesis in my career. You know, you've looked at everything and you worked incredibly hard. But a really important form of work is to stand back and synthesize and create a hierarchy of ideas, okay? So the same editing you didn't do in the, in the theory section and the examples, you didn't do in the proposal. So this is my strong wish to you, someone with your energy, kind of uh, maniacal ability to do things, good on you, you'll get hired tomorrow, you'll be productive. But boy, have you got to get that editor going. You know, in other words, when you say things, make them appropriate and build up an argument, tell us what you think. And the same thing, make a system for the city by all means, but load it uh, with activity, make some things more important than others, create a system through which it might work other than uh, just a kind of uh, schematic concept overextended. Thank you, Trevor. So Thank you very much. Uh, I would like not to have any more responses because uh, we are at 2.16 and we need to um, uh, get ready for the next uh, thesis. So I thank you, Trevor, very much uh, for actually summarizing for us. Uh, and I wanna thank David as well too for, for being with us. And of course, Yuri and, 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 uh, and Carlo, who's done all the heavy lifting. Uh, uh, and I just, sit here looking good uh, being the MC. Uh, and on that note, uh, I'm going to ask Alex to uh, leave and the committee can adjourn and uh, basically uh, determine your destiny, I guess. So if you can leave right now uh, and the rest of us can stay. And then I think Yuri is going to talk to Alex after this. Yeah. Okay. Privately. Yeah. Uh, what, how will that, what format will that happen in? Uh, Yuri will you i'll and send you a zoom um, invite. Yep. okay sounds yeah, good thank you guys that'll be a separate meeting thank you alex thanks thank alex you.